Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. And we're working on a series titled 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Uh, out of 101 verses, uh, we're almost at the very end now, only a few verses left to go in this series. Uh, so if you have not seen all the previous videos, they're on the playlist on my YouTube channel, 101 Videos Proving Faith Alone. So I, I hope you'll go watch it from the beginning. And more important than that, I, I hope you'll share it with any of those people who either uh, don't believe in faith alone or are, are uh, they're unsure. So this could be a good tool. Hopefully that's, that's the purpose it will serve. Okay, brother. Uh, Shall I read you the first verse? Yeah, I'm ready. I think we have eight more verses in the series. And maybe do four today, four next time. Okay, guess what? I'm looking at the time, 6.39. Ah, now we finally did it. <laughs> now we know when an hour will be up. <laughs> okay, uh, the first verse is Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission of is no remission. Oh, you're uh, muted. Your your mic your microphone's up. No. All right, we're working the kinks out today, but we'll get it right. Um, so this is. In Hebrews 9, the beginning of really showing that all the cardinal ordinances and the feasts and the Levitical priesthood and animal sacrifices, how that was a shadow of things to come and how Jesus, who all those things pointed to, was the fulfillment of those. And so this is the beginning of that. Um, pointing out um, that a New Testament, Jesus Christ, um, has fulfilled the old law. And, you know, this is basically looking back at Leviticus 17, 11, that says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So, you know, it's it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, and there's a lot of these heretics that will leave, leave out the blood. You know, I can think of John MacArthur, for instance, that says that the blood's not important. Uh, well, he reads a Bible that it leaves out the blood in a lot of key verses. I think he uses the English Standard Version. Um, this verse is very clear that without the shedding of blood is no remission. Um, so Jesus' death and the shedding of that blood brought forth a New Testament. The testator died and he is a mediator of the new covenant that we become a part of through faith in him. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the thing that does, uh, makes me curious about this verse, uh, I have an opinion, but I, I'd like to get your opinion first. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Uh, almost, it doesn't say all things, it says almost all things. What is your opinion on why does it say almost all things? Um, let's see. I'm going to defer to you on this. Uh, I haven't really thought about that. Well, um, it, 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 I guess it puts us right back in the middle of that uh, debate or argument, disagreement about what is this unpardonable sin that Jesus talked about. You know, um, there's a lot of different opinions and, and um, viewpoints on that that I've heard uh, over the years. I've 
change my opinion off and on, but um, I think that uh, there is one sin that uh, is, let's just say that with, with the sin of unbelief, uh, that the blood doesn't do you any good. And that boils down to, gets back to the, the very beginning. The sin that created all man's problems from, the, from Adam and Eve to present time, it's always been one sin, and that's unbelief. Adam and Eve, um, it's commonly believed their sin was disobedience, uh, fall, uh, you know, uh, eating uh, from the tree, uh, but I believe the sin was before they disobeyed, before they ate from the tree. The sin was unbelief. God wanted them to believe him. God wanted them to trust him. God wanted them to rely on him. That's uh, symbolized by the tree of life. Just God says, don't, don't uh, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life is, is what they were supposed to be uh, living on and uh, relying on. And that's a picture of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think as Jesus was on that wooden cross, um, that's a, a picture of, of him uh, and being the tree of life. Uh, so the, the, the first sin was Adam and Eve didn't believe God. And they, they were unwilling to just trust and rely on God because God said that you don't need to know good and evil. That's what you get from that tree. You'll understand good and evil, right and wrong. And why would they want to know right and wrong? Why would they seek that knowledge? Uh, it's because they were tempted by Satan that if you know right and wrong, you'll be like God. In other words, you won't need God anymore. You can be your own God. You'll be like God. You can make your own decisions uh, because you'll know right and wrong and you can decide for yourself. Uh, so the sin that got them in trouble, the sin that caused death to, to come to all of their descendants is the sin of unbelief. They believed the devil. They believed his lie. They didn't believe God when God said, don't eat from the tree or you'll surely die. Um, so throughout history, that's been the one sin that causes death and, uh, uh, and damnation and condemnation. And it's true when Jesus talked about it, uh, uh, unbelief was, was believing or not believing was the issue. Um, and today, that's the same thing is true. Uh, Jesus paid for all sins, but belief is the one thing that is unpardonable today. You must put your faith in Jesus. And uh, if you don't, then uh, even though Jesus died for all of our sins, it does them no good. They cannot receive the gift of eternal life if they have failed in that one point, and that's faith. I made a video titled Faith, the One Requirement. Uh, so... I think what comes to my mind, and again, I've never even paid much attention to this verse. I've never tried to answer this question before. But to me, when it says almost all things are by the law purged with blood, I'm thinking, well, what, how could it be almost? There, there must be an exception. Well, there's one thing that is unforgivable, and that is to not trust God for your salvation. And now with the New Testament, we know that the God that we must trust is Jesus, was revealed as our Savior God. That's just my thoughts, but I'm not sure I'm right. Yeah, and that was my initial thought when, you know, you posed that question to me. I defer back to you, but, um, you know, it's, and, you know, some people will get caught up on, you know, did I do anything to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? And, you know, and that's the unpardonable sin. Um but by assuming the Holy Ghost, that's not believing, you know, it's unbelief. And so it's the sin of unbelief um, that ultimately you would blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So, um, yeah, the blood doesn't purge unbelief. Um, that is what 
the the law is for and all those laws that we've broken those can be purged but in order for us to be in christ and be a child of god we have to use the law lawfully and properly at, to lead us as a schoolmaster to christ and put our trust in him to go from unbelief to belief okay i i, I don't know if um um, uh, Nami Anna uh, is uh, the name of a YouTuber that made a comment on one of our uh, videos in the series. And uh, I, I guess that's the name, Nami Anna, N A M I O N N A. So uh, I, I think this would be a good time for us to tell Nami Anna that. Okay, here's your question you asked us to answer. And uh, this is in context is probably relevant to this uh, verse here. It says, uh, uh, really nice videos, uh, referring to this series that we're doing, spend, uh, spend a whole night around listening to these. I would like you guys to touch more on the subject of neo-nomianism or what Jason Jack mentioned about the cultish teaching that Jesus supposedly brought up his own new set of laws to live under that some kind uh, of believe. Uh, not sure if you understand what I mean, but I, I think those people really do not believe that Jesus was the end of the law. Yes, this neo-nomianism or whatever it's officially called, it's another minor cult belief out there. You know, when I read this originally, brother, I, I read it entirely wrong. Uh, I thought, just because I'm not used to seeing the name neo-nomianism, I, I was thinking this uh, uh, anti-nomianism. So maybe you can uh, define the difference between those two terms and, and then answer her question. Or I don't know if Nami Ana is a male or female, so I apologize for that. Well, Antinomianism is without law, and so that's what a lot of people that will teach the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that, that it's not by our actions, you know, are following the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified, it's by faith in Christ, and cr faith in Christ alone, that we will be labeled, that uh, we're teaching lawlessness, our license to sin. So my answer for that is, you know, everybody that has come to Jesus Christ has acknowledged that they're a sinner and have has used the law properly. They've looked into the law, they've seen their flaws, and then they've understood that they can't keep it. And the law was given to show us that we couldn't keep it perfectly, therefore to lead us as a schoolmaster to Christ. And so the law was given so that every mouth should be stopped, maybe stopped, you know, so that we have nothing to boast in because it's by grace through faith are we saved and it's not of works lest any man should boast. So the law is given. So every mouth may, may be stopped, you know, not boasting in, Oh, I'm keeping these because I'm saved and look at how good I am. And let's look at the law and look at all the great things I'm doing. And that proves my salvation. That's not how it works. You look towards the cross. You don't look back at the law. You look at what he did for you, not what you're doing. Um, and so if you have, you know, out before I was saved, I was still using the law, but I just hadn't used it properly to get me to Christ. But I still thought the law was good and I was still trying to uphold it. I was I was establishing my own righteousness. Now, I haven't I hadn't submitted my you know, I hadn't submitted myself to the righteousness of God yet. I was still trying to follow the law and thinking I was a good person and that my good deeds outweighed my bad deeds and all this. But after I realized I couldn't uphold it perfectly and I was a sinner and I needed help, I needed a savior. It pointed me to Jesus Christ and I depended on what he did for me, his death, burial, and resurrection to overcome death for me, to purge me from all those sins. And he paid it all. Um, so now that I am placing my faith fully in Jesus Christ, that still doesn't mean that I don't think the law is good. 
I mean, I still want to uphold the law. I'm just not trusting in it because it doesn't have any life in it. And, and so that's kind of an answer for, you know, this license to sin that, that will get thrown out, you know, people telling others the true gospel and being labeled as uh, antinomianist. But what NAMI is talking about is neonomianism, and that's a new law. So there's a lot of this, and usually it goes like this. And I went to a church that, whether they admit it or not, taught this. Um, and this is Church of Christ. And what they do is they look at Jesus as a person that brought in a new set of laws. So God abolished the old law. And so they will look at the Old Testament and the old laws and think that that's how everybody before the cross was saved by worshiping God and obeying God and doing all the things in the Old Testament. But now those old laws were abolished. And since Jesus came, there's a new set of laws. And so that's why you'll see all these sort of cult-like churches will look at the New Testament and specifically the book of Acts where they're trying to see everything that happened right after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and what the churches were doing because they thought that he just simply brought in a new set of laws. So circumcision was abolished, but now it's water baptism. And these different sets of dietary laws and divers washings and all this that was abolished but now we have the lord's supper that we have to do and so it's a just a weird perversion of jesus mission they they don't get it at all and these churches will use those new laws and establish doctrines of men in these earthly churches and say that they are the one true church. They have figured it out. They're doing everything that the first church in Jerusalem did in 33 AD. And this is how you must be saved by to follow all these new laws that Jesus brought in. And oh yeah, you got to believe on it. So that's what neonomianism is. And it is, you know, such a just a a terrible spiritual blindness um you know to not see that you know jesus mission who is god manifest in the flesh was not to bring in a new set of rules because that's not how it was ever in the old testament people in the old testament got saved by faith you know abraham believed god and his faith was counted for righteousness you know, the blood of bulls and goats didn't save anyone. You know, it's not circumcision of the flesh. It's circumcision of the heart. It's always been by faith. So they mix that up and then they mix what Jesus did. You know, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He fulfilled it. And he basically fulfilled man's part. God fulfilled his part. I made a video about this that, you know, God made this since the beginning. God made this everlasting covenant with mankind that he would be our God and we would be his children if we kept his commandments. But we didn't. And every person has failed in doing it. But this covenant that he made was still an everlasting covenant because God cannot lie. So how is that if we broke it? Because God kept both sides of the covenant. He kept his part because he's God and cannot lie, but he kept man's part in the person of Jesus Christ because God is love. And so in order to be reconciled back into this everlasting covenant that God has made with mankind since the creation, we have to be in Christ who fulfilled the law, kept it perfectly, and therefore fulfilled our part of the everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. 
right. Uh, I have, I'm going to try to be very careful because uh, I could just monopolize this and go on for an hour, um, all the thoughts I'm having on this. Uh, but I, 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 there's a couple of things I really have to, to say. And uh, to me, one of the saddest things about Christianity is that very few people realize that uh, following laws was never God's way. In Romans 10, 3, it, it, it says that they're seeking to establish their own righteousness instead of relying on the righteousness of Christ. Uh, that's not, uh, that's man's way of trying to do it, but that's not God's way. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the point of the verse. And so man's way, uh, from the beginning, I go back to Adam and Eve, the same thing still applies. Adam and Eve would not abide by God's way. God's way was, I don't want you to learn right and wrong and, and set up a set of rules for right and wrong and then you, you become independent and you don't need me and you can just try to establish your own righteousness by being able to follow the laws of good and evil. The, you know, if you get the knowledge from that tree, you'll you'll know, so you think you, you can do it. So that was the, uh, but it was never God's way. God's way was for us just to trust him. Uh, when we go through uh, the Bible and we get to the nation of Israel, we, we find that Israel was, the uh, Bible calls them at least several times a peculiar people. God picked uh, a family first, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Jacob became Israel, and Israel became a nation, and then he, it was this nation. They were chosen for a, a, a purpose to bless the whole world through the Savior. But when the nation of Israel was established, this system of mosaic laws were set up. Two things people fail to get right, and it's this is tragic to me. One, they don't understand that the laws were never set up as a means of achieving salvation. And they don't understand that the Mosaic laws were not given to the whole world. They were given to the nation of Israel. Uh, there are 613 Mosaic laws. Uh, they're all in writing, but 10 of them were written with the finger of God on stone. So whether you're talking about the 10 or all 613, these are the laws that God gave the nation of Israel. The Bible never says, God told Israel that if you follow these laws, you'll go to heaven and have eternal life. But it does say over and over again, if you follow the laws, you'll be blessed. You'll be healthy, you'll be prosperous, you'll have a big nation, you have the promised land. All these blessings will come. So the, the purpose of the law for Israel was never to work your way to heaven. It was to be blessed. And the same thing I could say is true today. People who think that they can use the law to work their way to heaven, if I follow the law well enough, God will be happy with me and he'll accept me. You know, uh, that's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is, look, don't commit adultery. Well, why not? It's so much fun having sex with all these women. You know, my, you know, my wife's not enough. Well, because you'll get sexually transmitted diseases and you'll get caught and your wife will divorce you and there will be a broken family and you know, all these tragic things result from you doing, doing that. God is not telling us to not fornicate and commit adultery because he wants to spoil our fun. He's telling us not to do it because he knows what's best for us. He tells us don't steal. Why? Because when you steal, you get caught, you go to jail. You get caught, you get shot with a big man's shotgun as you come into his house. There are consequences for doing the wrong things and there are blessings for doing the right things. That's how the law should have been used. Uh, and that's the purpose of the law for us today. If we, if we follow the basic, uh, uh, the laws of conscience were given to the Gentile world, the Mosaic laws were given to the nation of Israel. But whether it's Mosaic laws or the laws of our conscience, uh, if we do the right things, our lives are going to be better. If we do the wrong things, there's bad consequences that we suffer. But the consequence of not going to heaven and instead going to hell, 
that is not determined by how well or, or poorly we are able to follow the laws. So number one, the laws were never given as a, as a formula to work your way to heaven. And number two, the laws of Moses were never given to the whole world. They were given to Israel. That's the, the, the big mistake. So, uh, but what purpose does the law serve today for us? Well, it still serves the purpose of being a schoolmaster so we can show our, we can recognize our failures. And, and in that way, we can call on God and say, look, I failed. I, I'm in a hopeless situation. I need to be saved. I need God rescuing me. The purpose of Jesus, when he was talking about following all the laws, and he said, well, that's not good enough. You can't just not commit adultery. You can't even have a lustful thought. You know, Jesus ratcheted it down and made it so difficult, he didn't want to give you any wiggle room out of it. He wanted to convict you and make you a real say, like the disciples finally said to him, well, if that's the case, Lord, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? That's the conclusion that we all have to come to. Jesus used that technique to make his apostles recognize it's impossible with man, but with God it's possible. Salvation is possible only if you appeal to God and you trust God to provide it. And he wants you, the viewer, just as Brother Jason and I did, we all came to this conclusion that it's impossible to work my way to heaven. I need to trust Jesus instead. So that's the purpose of the law, to, so we, to understand our hopeless, helpless situation and cry out to Jesus and say, uh, um, you know, we're not saved by saying, Lord, save me like Peter did out of the boat, but, but our call on the name of the Lord just means put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus and you'll be saved. That's the conclusion that we need to come to, and the law is what helps us get reach, reach that point. And the law also serves the purpose, as I said, is you're not going to go to jail. You're not going to get divorces. You're not going to have sexually transmitted diseases. You're not going to have all these bad consequences if you follow the basic laws that we find in the Bible, even the simple laws that Jesus said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. All right, brother. Amen. Father knows best. Okay. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, helps Nami, Anna, and anybody else. Uh, you ready to go on to the next verse? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so the next one is uh, 1 Timothy 2.6. And it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You're uh, muted. Your microphone's muted again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let me just read it. Um, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. This comes right before um, 1 Timothy 2.5, which says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And just like I said, you know, Jesus came not to bring in a new law, or anything like that. He came to fulfill the law uh, for for us, you know, uh, to redeem us, to be our deliverer uh, from the wrath of the law. If we put our faith in Him, and He's the mediator, uh, you know, He says, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me," and that is through our faith in what He did, His death, burial, and resurrection. That's what overcame death. That's what purged our sins and gave us the remission of sins. Um, you know, he paid our sin penalty on the cross, um, you know, and redeemed us. You know, he, he ransomed us, you know, a ransom is a payment to, you know, for, for somebody else, you know, to deliver somebody or to redeem something. Uh, and that's what he did for us. Um, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's, it's God's love for us. You know, seeing we couldn't fulfill the law perfectly ourselves, that we're flesh and we're mortal. Um, but giving us 
a ransom, giving us a redeemer, a deliverer um, who paid that penalty for us. Okay, well, one of the things I like about this verse is the word, the word all. Uh, there's another verse uh, that uh, Jesus said, I don't know where it is, you'll find it, I'm sure. It says, um, Jesus speaking said, uh, do not think I came to be served, uh, but rather, I'm, I, KJV, I think it says minister. Uh, do not think I came to be ministered to, but rather to minister and to give my life as a ransom for many. So what do the horrible cultish apostate heretic Calvinists do? They latch on to that word many, as you see. Uh, he gave his life for many. You know, many doesn't mean everybody in the world. So they use a, that word to prop up their heresy of limited atonement. That the teaching that Christ only died for part of the people, but not all the people. Uh, he only died for what they call the elect. Or the, um, and first of all, yeah, without this verse, we could easily explain that uh, all the people is many. <laughs> you know, if there's uh, how many people have lived uh, since the beginning of time, I think there's around 7 billion now. Maybe before this present population, there's another 3 billion. I don't know. So let's say there's been 10 billion people in the history of the world. He died for all of them, 10 billion people, and that's many. <laughs> you see? So many does not mean it's not all. It just means it's many. But in this case, we can set that problem aside completely because in this case it says all. But then the dumb Calvinists, I mean, I, I want to go on and on insulting them because there's, it's, there's, it's, a, it's a devilish, horrible philosophy. Uh, they they cannot accept that uh, words have simple meanings. So I have a playlist how words have meanings. But because if they actually just trust the Bible for the words and for what they mean, then the, all the doctrines of Calvinism are totally crumbled. Uh, but what they do is they're forced to redefine words that we know. Uh, even a, a 10 year old could give you a definition. What does all mean? Uh, what does whosoever mean? What does the world mean? But they have to redefine words that everybody agrees except for Calvinists. We all agree what the words mean, but they have to redefine them and say, no, all doesn't mean all. See, it says, it says uh, who gave himself a ransom for all. No, that's all the Calvinists. That's all the elect, all the saved, uh, the, the saved people, not for all the world, even though another verse will say for the whole world. Well, it's not the whole world as you understand it. So they have to redefine things, and it's just an insult to the English language. It's an insult to everybody's intelligence, but mostly it's an insult to our great Savior God because they turn God into the devil, worse than the devil. The devil is actually an innocent party in Calvinism. The devil's innocent. All of humanity is innocent because God controls the devil and all of mankind is a puppet. He makes you do everything you ever did like a puppet master. And so there, who's really the guilty party? It's God who's controlling us and forcing us to sin. In Calvinism, I could go before God and say, God, I'm, I'm innocent. You're the one that controlled me and made me do it. You're the guilty party. <laughs> you know? All right, enough said on that. Uh, any more on that verse before I go on? Uh, that was great. I want to show in Job, you know, I'll, we both like to go back to Job and refer back to it to show some of, um, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and that he was a redeemer, that he um, is a ransom for all. And those type of, you know, salvific terms we see a lot of those same terms in the Old Testament 
as a shadow of Jesus and what he would do for mankind. Um, and so Job 33 says in verse 22, Yea, his soul draweth near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man its uprightness, then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Youth, he shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, and he will render unto man his righteousness. So obviously this is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ um, as being a ransom from death that we would have a resurrection as Job goes on later in the book of Job and, and prophecies of that. Um, and that he will render his righteousness to mankind. And we receive that through faith. Uh, he imputes his righteousness unto our account once we place our trust in him. And so these terms, ransom, redeemed, um, are mentioned a lot throughout the Bible. In Hosea 13, 14, it says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Uh, so all these are shadows of um, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've always loved the word ransom. I'm glad Jesus used the word. Uh, it's a word that's pretty easy to understand, and it really it really hits the nail on the head. And that, that you said it, uh, if you were kidnapped, and they contacted me and said, here's a ransom for Jason, pay this ransom. And uh, I, I raised the money and I paid the ransom. So it's something that you do on someone else's behalf, a payment made to set someone else free. Now, uh, the payment that Jesus made was the blood that we talked about earlier. The blood, the suffering, the death, all that was the payment. And uh, Jesus made the payment. It's not something we do. He, he did it for us. He had to do it for us because you can't pay your own ransom. Uh, uh, well, I guess in that scenario, you, you could say, hey, I give my bank account. But in this case, you can't. You have to, you're, you're in a helpless situation. So you need, as Jesus said, with man it's impossible. With God it's possible. We need to rely on God. And Jesus is the one that paid the ransom. Uh, but it's a payment made to set someone else free. But what are they set free from? Not from the kidnappers. In this case, you're set free from condemnation, condemnation, judgment, and the second death. Uh, Jesus said, um, whoever believes in, uh, in the Son, no, who, uh, whoever believes in me is not condemned. Whoever believeth not is condemned already. So from the time, well, this may be a disagreement here. I was going to say from the time we're born, our whole life, man, all of mankind is condemned. And by putting our faith in Jesus, we're no longer condemned. Uh, and we're no longer uh, going to be judged because he says he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. So there's no more judgment against us to as far as eternal life in heaven. Um, we get judged to see how much rewards we get for our ministry works at the judgment seat of Christ, but not judged whether we're worthy to go to heaven. Uh, and then we also are... are uh, the ransom is we're set free from the sentence, the death sentence of the second death in the lake of fire. Uh, so to me, those are all the things I get from this concept of a, of a ransom. Um, any more before we go to the next one? No, we can go ahead. Okay. All right. This one is Acts 10, 43. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him 
shall receive remission of sins. So this is Peter that is obviously discussing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and pointing to Jesus Christ as being God manifest in the flesh and that his ransom um, for all has forgiven all sins, but you receive this payment through faith and belief. And that's what he's showing here. He's pointing people back to the prophets who prophesied of Jesus Christ and specifically his name, the name Jesus, uh, the name above all names, that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins or forgiveness of sins, sometimes of liberty of sins. You know, we're no longer under the law, you know, and the knowledge of sin. Those sins have been washed clean. They've been purged once and for all. And, you know, this is very reminiscent of Peter's Pentecostal sermon in Acts 2, where he says basically the same thing. Um, you know, Acts 10.43 is saying the same exact thing as Acts 2.38. But you'll have a lot of these Pentecostal churches that will use Acts 2.38 that will twist that verse and say that repent when Jesus, when Peter says, you know, and Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They will say, Oh, he's telling them to repent of all their sins. But Peter wasn't telling the Jews to, you know, give up all their sinning. He was telling them to turn from unbelief. They had just crucified Jesus Christ because of unbelief. Turn from unbelief and put your trust in him. Believe that he is the Messiah. And the name is important, you know, it's the name of Jesus that is for remission of sins, you know, and people will use that verse and say, you know, um, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And they will say, well, you have to be water baptized to be forgiven of sins. See right there in Acts 238. But for the remission of sins simply means that because of what Jesus Christ did, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You turn from unbelief to belief in Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins that he paid, that he forgave, um, not water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save you. So this is the same thing that Peter's saying in Acts 10.43, as he said in Acts 2.38, to him giveth all the prophets witness, that through his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, whosoever believeth, so repent, turn from unbelief to belief in him. Again, the focus is on what Jesus did. Shall receive the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, just like it says in Acts 2.38. Mm -hmm. Well, jeez, um, there's... It says, to him, give all the prophets witness. To him, um, that's re referencing Jesus. All the prophets from the, the Old Testament, they're all witnessing about Jesus. They're, the Old Testament is all talking to, talking about and pointing to this future person. And it turns out it was Jesus. Uh, that through his name, uh, now I agree with you that the significance of his name is um, uh, it's penultimate, I think is a good word for it. Uh, here, uh, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that say that there's something special about this name. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's the name above all names. And several times in the Gospel of John, it talks about you saved by believing in his name. Um, and I've always felt that his name isn't by, wasn't chosen by chance. It's like, you know, hey, should we name him uh, John or, or, or Reuben or, or 
you know, uh, Peter or whatever, you know, there's all kinds of names. Let's just pick one up. Jesus literally translates to, if we go to the, the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. Originally, it, actually, it was Joshua. I don't know if people realize that, but Joshua is a also a picture of Jesus, the, the prophet Joshua, who, who followed uh, Moses. But Joshua is just another uh, way of uh, pronouncing the name Yeshua, and Yeshua is another way of saying Jesus. So whichever way it's pronounced, I, I think God uh, is bilingual. You can understand it, whatever language. But the point is, they all have the same meaning. And what does the name Jesus literally translate to? God saves. So when we believe in the name of Jesus, we're believing in the concept, the doctrine, that God saves us. We need God to save us. And we, rather than thinking that we don't need God to save us, we can solve the problem on our own. Just eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll know right and wrong, and then you'll do, exercise good judgment, and you'll do the right thing, and you don't need God. No, we are failures. We all fall short of the glory of God. So we need to recognize that we need God to save us. And as revel, as, as uh, knowledge and uh, uh, the gospel was more and more dispensed throughout history, more and more uh, information was given to us. And now the name above all names, the saving name has been given where it's identified. The one they looked forward to is revealed. His name is Jesus, and not coincidentally, it means God saves. <laughs> so believe in Jesus, who is God who saves. Uh, so the name is that important. And when it says whosoever, of course, that's another word that Calvinists have to redefine because it says whosoever. That means any person without exception. Uh, not not just, uh, you know, the elect that the Calvinists like to think that they're a special elect little group of people that uh, God uh, wants to save and the rest of everybody else he want, God wants to torture, you know. But, you know, whosoever, any person who believes in Jesus shall receive remission of sins. Now, here's the remission of sins, brother. I don't know. I've had to deal with the uh, Paul Onius probably more than you have. I've had... I've watched, I bet you I've watched a hundred hours at least of their videos on teachings of, uh, that are, that I call them Paul Onius, hyper dispensationalists, the people who are, are always saying, rightly divide, rightly divide. But what they're doing is they're over dividing. They're saying, get rid of everything except for the uh, Romans through Philemon. Get rid of everything else. You know, we don't need that. It's only Romans through Philemon. Well, what they've done, these, these Paul Onius, uh, is I've actually heard them teach, among a hundred other things I don't like, they've been teaching that the word remittance, in, the, in this case, it's, uh, it's not uh, referencing uh, uh, sins being paid like propitiation. Propitiation means it's paid in full. The debt is paid. Sin's a problem is resolved. Remission, though, means like, well, their cancer went into remission. They still got cancer. It's just temporarily... Uh, you know, uh, under control, uh, it's in remission. Uh, so they don't believe that when we see the word remission, it's the same thing as propitiation. What do you think, brother? Yeah, it's, it means forgiveness. You know, it's it's the appe you know propitiation, the appeasement. You know, God appeased Himself through the person of Jesus Christ. You know, for the propitiation of sins. And, and, you know, it's a, a paid once and for all. And so I, you know, when, when you, when you get to that point where you're hyper dispensationalist and that's why, I, you know, teach so hard not to do that because it will, it will lead you into error. And it'll take you down a rabbit hole if you keep going down where you're rightly dividing the word of God so much that it's chopped in all these parts. And then you just look at this one specific part and then you have to redefine things, you know, just like we were talking about with uh, Calvinism, you know, in order for them to teach their doctrine, they have to redefine several obvious um 
meanings of names and you know and, and twist things and it perverts you know the entirety of the word of god in the gospel um so i just try to keep it real simple you know <laughs> i just use scripture and try to allow the holy spirit just to guide me into truth and you know uh i love being edified and and with with brothers in christ and um but i really don't read a lot of you know books or anything about the bible uh, I used to, and I learned my lesson because I never got to the truth until I picked up the Word of God. So I would, you know, just learn from my mistakes. Whoever's watching this, if you're new, um, pick up the Bible and start reading. Start at the book of John. Um, understand the gospel. Get saved and then use the Holy Spirit that indwells all believers to lead you into further truth. Um, you know, go through the New Testament like we talked about the other day, um, you know, through through um, the Pauline epistles, hit Genesis so you can see the uh, Old Testament truths with um, New Testament scripture. Uh, just like uh, we were talking about, you know, uh, Jesus means God saves and Yeshua or Joshua. Well, just read the end of Deuteronomy where Moses dies prior to getting to the promised land is Joshua that took the children of Israel into the promised land. So that, you know, real events, real people, but showing a deeper spiritual truth with Moses representing the law. And if you trust in the law and that you're following the law and that's getting your way to heaven, you're never going to make it into the promised land. You're going to die before you get there. You're going to fall short of the glory of God. You must put your faith in Joshua, in Jesus, right, to lead you into the promised land. Uh, so that's what, you know, there's so many, there's so many spiritual truths, you know. Uh, I think 1 Corinthians 10 talks about that. You know, a lot of that in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about um, how Old Testament real events and 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 people you know are used as an example for us today you know it was used for the children of israel at that time but also um afterwards after the cross you know in the in the churches that paul was establishing um uh, throughout the mediterranean and abroad and you know obviously um the word of god is preserved for all generations and it's for all generations. So we um, learn those same spiritual truths and can be edified and, and mature in the faith um, with those words. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, discussed uh, those uh, uh, very interesting things we learn from uh, Moses and Joshua, as you said. So the next verse is Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So this is the Lord uh, speaking to um, Isaiah and Isaiah prophesying, obviously, of Jesus Christ. Um, Isaiah, the 66 chapters in Isaiah, so amazing. Um, you could read it a hundred times and still get new things out of it, um, all pointing to Jesus. And, you know, this verse, obviously, in Isaiah 43 is prophesying of Jesus and the Lord's salvific role. You know, what's impossible for man is possible with God. He does the saving. Uh, we can't save ourselves. Uh, we trust that he is the Savior and that he can um ransom us redeem us uh and he has you know through um his work on the cross his finished work on the cross and you know this if you just look back um a few verses in isaiah 43 3 says for i am the lord thy god the holy one of israel thy savior I gave Egypt for thy ransom. So there's the word ransom again, uh, Ethiopia and see before thee, but, you know, establishes himself that, that 
you know, he's, he's coming to open the blind people's eyes and open the deaf people's ears. You know, this is the gospel that's being prophesied of the gospel that was being preached back then too, you know, but they, like you said, they just didn't have all the mysteries of the gospel and of God at that time. And God over generations has revealed more and more um, to us. But the gospel has always been the same, the good news of a redeemer to come. And this is Isaiah prophesying of the redeemer, Jesus Christ, the savior. And, you know, another key here is there's no other savior. You know, there's no other way. Um, you know, and that's not as, as a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't say that, that your God can't save you out of condemnation, but out of truth. It's a spiritual truth. Um, and so in for me to show somebody else brotherly love, I'm just going to simply just tell them the gospel, tell them what can save them, point them to the savior who if they put their trust in that they will be redeemed through faith. Um, and so, you know, there's no other way, you know, again, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the father, but by me, you know, there's no other name under heaven given on men whereby we must be saved. That's Jesus Christ. Um, quoting Acts 4:12. Uh, he's the only savior. And he always will be, as it says, uh, if you continue reading um, before or yeah, in verse 10, before me, there was no God form. Neither shall there be after me. I even I am the Lord and beside me, there is no savior. So Jesus is from everlasting. God is everlasting. Um, the Alpha and Omega. And there's no other God before him. There will never be another God after him. And he is the only savior of the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I, uh, I've always had uh, tried to follow the policy of um, when I want to denounce or rebuke, uh, I, I don't like to mention names if I can help it. I want to denounce a doctrine or a false belief system. Um, but if, if someone is big enough, and then of course I'm, I want to mention their name because they have a great platform, a great audience, uh, a, a great um, a potential to send people to hell through uh, false uh, religion and heresy. So I, I'll, I'll name a few names. When it says Jesus is uh, the only Savior, beside me there is no Savior. So who's got the Savior? Allah can't save you. Uh, Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Uh, the Pope can't save you. The Virgin Mary can't save you. You can't save yourself either. So if you think that, well, you're just going to work your way to heaven through your own efforts, forget that. You can't be your own savior. Only Jesus can save you. He's the only savior, it says here, and dozens of other places in the Bible, we can. it states it, but we conclude. Jesus is the only way. He said in his own in his own words, I am the way. The way, not he didn't say I'm a way. He says, I'm the truth. So he's the one and only truth you need to believe. The one truth you better get right. I am the life. He's the source of life everlasting. No other way you can get life everlasting. And then he emphasizes it. Uh, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. So there's no wiggle room out of that. <laughs> Besides Jesus, there is no Savior. Um, now, the uh, oh, there was something else I was going to say that I forgot, but we're, we're rather out of time, so I think we have a couple of minutes for you to summarize everything. Is that all right? That sounds great. Okay, go ahead. Well, this was fun. We got four verses in, so we have four more. So I think the next video will be our last one. So in our penultimate um, video on this 101 verses of faith alone, I thought we covered a lot of great verses. 
uh, in the book of Hebrews, we talked about um, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And then in Acts 10, 43, we see that Jesus redeemed us and through faith in him and what he did for us, his death, burial, and re resurrection, he remisses our sins for us. He forgives our sins. And there's no other God. There's no other Savior. It's Jesus Christ. And he loves the world and is a ransom for all. He died for all men and he paid for all sins and they're already paid for, you know, he fulfilled the law and paid for the sins that the law shows that we were under, you know, we're under the wrath of the law, but by using his schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, then we're no, no longer under the law. We're not under wrath anymore. We're resting. You know, we're under grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's how to become in Christ and overcome what the law brings, wrath, the second death. And so um, I thought this was a really good uh, study. A lot of verses that, you know, you, you may not uh, necessarily go to soul winning, you know, when you're discussing, um, you know, faith alone and and showing the the gospel of what jesus did for us it's not what we do it's what he did that's how um you know we receive eternal life is to put our trust in what he did and relinquish any of our own works and efforts um there's filthy rags you know and if we add those works then it nullifies grace you know it we're it, it makes the the cross of none effect um, we have to solely rely on the Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, I guess um, with only a few verses left, uh, next time will we'll be the conclusion. We should be able to get through those remaining verses, and that will be the final video of this series. Um, we try to keep these uh, approximately an hour. So I'm looking forward to the uh, finale. And after that, I'm looking forward to the next uh, subject project that we've uh, discussed to decide that we will go forward with another one. And that will remain a mystery until we reveal it later. So we'll keep everybody in suspense. <laughs> All right, brother, I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy life to work with me on this. Thank you. And to the viewers, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. Jesus.